All right, let's get started. Um, so today we have the midterm exams been posted, and uh, I'll do that at the end. How's that? Um, and we're going to finish this lecture here. So I'll start this lecture out. And I know we're not going to start from slide number one. We were on slide number 109, if I remember this right. If you guys are in the HTML and CSS, excuse me, this is the HTML and CSS class. If you're in the computer graphics class, there's no class today. Instead, at 12.30, we have the um, lunch, the Halloween lunch party, um, which is in a direct, it overlaps with the class. So, you know, priorities, Halloween's more important. So, <laughs> we must have food and Halloween candy and stuff instead of class. But don't worry about it. Uh, so let's see, this class is going as scheduled, and uh, make sure to do the attendance. Uh, the TA is going to do it in the back. So let me see. Kill enough time here trying to get to the right slide. Uh, we stopped on decision making, and we're talking about JavaScript. And we looked at JavaScript as being an object, and we had information about the object with attributes and different object types where <coughs> we had arrays. Um, actually, we had strings, booleans, arrays, variable object types. Everything is an object in an object-oriented language. And we had compound objects, objects that have objects inside of them as well. This is what it looked like here with a name object. And the name object is a string, and it has a first name, a middle name, a last name. It's inside of a person object with a, an age object inside of there as well. So we had the same kind of hierarchy that we get in other programming languages. And we have the document object model, which is why it's called the document object model. It's a model of objects for the um, web browser to interpret. And it's the window.close, window.location, uh, history, length, or some examples of using window. And uh, we could use document the same way. And what we're doing is we're running methods, or we are uh, looking for attributes that are associated with each one of the um, object components. You missed the photo session in the beginning. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm just the thing. It's okay. You could do it now. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. <laughs> if it did, I wouldn't be wearing this outfit. <laughs> so, object methods. So, methods themselves are used as functions, just like they are in other programming languages. And so, we have document write foo. It's an example here. The method write takes and writes something to the screen, as we've seen so far. And we talked about the window. We talked about the confirm method. Uh, true or false, which brings up a little box that says, uh, is this true or is this false, kind of thing. And uh, document, uh, excuse me, window.location here that changes the web browser to a different location. Um, window.history as well. And then we have properties that are associated uh, along with the methods so we can change data about the student, the first name, the last name, all the different things, and the values that are associated to it. Here's class <coughs> dot student dot name is equal to Frank. And uh, the interesting thing about objects in um, JavaScript to remember is that um, we don't create the class and then we create instances of those. Instead, we just create the objects. And on the fly, we're creating the methods for the ones that we're doing ourselves. And then on the fly, we're also creating um, the data members and everything that goes along with the object. So it's not like in traditional programming, where you have to create the class and then you have to create an instance of the class to make the object and all the other stuff like a formal language. So it's a little bit easier. <clears throat> so we don't actually have to do this for any of the assignments, however, for this course. You don't have to create your own objects, but you will be using JavaScript um, with your HTML and CSS. And we also looked at the concept of events and how events are handled and doing the mouse over as an example and then creating a handler so that when the mouse is over something, the background color of the screen turns green in this particular case. <clears throat> and here's the on mouse out event. Variables are also um, part of the, the scheme here. Arrays, looked at the concept of the arrays. Arrays are actually interesting because we can put anything we want in the arrays. We can have an array of numbers, an array of letters, and we can take array items and use the index on them just like we do in other programming languages. Pets 0, pets 1. We could start with 1 and skip 0 if we want to. So we have that option as well. <coughs> and then uh, for the methods, which we've seen already, the right. And the thing with the document object model is that we get built-in methods. So we have the ability to uh, run built-in functionality that um, is already given for us, so we don't actually have to create that. 
and the functions, and we got this far as well, looking at array objects and being able to now run a built-in method called length on the array to return the length. We can also <coughs> run a sort on the method um, to pop, to push, treat the method like a stack or a queue, excuse me, treat the object like a stack or a queue. And here's an example of a variable A. We're using VAR, and maybe you remember this one, why we want to use VAR. Well, we're using VAR as a variable identifier that is going to be um, visible throughout the entire life of the program, or is it not? Hmm. Well, we don't have to use variable. If we don't use variable, we're not declaring it as a variable, and the visibility changes. So uh, variable A is going to be visible. So if we want to do a local one, we don't have to use variable. Or is it the opposite? You guys are looking at me like, I'm asking a question, actually. <laughs> Which one's visible? Variable or no variable? I'll let you ponder that one because that's like one of the questions I'm going to ask you probably on the final exam. So, okay, so we're now at the midterm and when I'm done with today's lecture, I'm going to um, show you the midterm. That's a take-home exam. Don't worry about it. There's no midterm exam today. It's Halloween. I'm going to give you a midterm. But it's a take-home that you'll do and you'll turn in. Uh, but on the final exam, you're going to have multiple choice questions. And one of them might be something in the nature of, you know, you don't have to use the word VAR, variable A, to declare a variable. If you do that, you make it global. So it's the life of the variables throughout the entire program. If you don't do that, you go A is equal to, because you don't have to, we don't have strong, we don't have any types, first of all. Everything's a string, which is another kind of tidbit of information to remember. We can take a string and convert it to a float, convert it to an integer and use it any way that we want. But we have this thing called global scope that where the variable could be visible. So if we had A, we took A and we created a function and we used A inside of the function, it's going to want to, is this the same A? Or is this the A from the outside of the function? So sometimes we use VAR to define the variable. Sometimes we just go A is equal to something or other. If we go A is equal to something or other, it's going to pull the A out from anywhere. So it actually kind of works the opposite because this is doing a declaration. Say, okay, right now, A is going to be equal to 8, 7, 6, 5. If I just said A is equal to, it's going to pick whatever A is out there and assign it. So if A already exists, it's going to change the value of A. So logically, it works in the opposite direction. So this is really which is kind of a tricky question because this is really local and just using A is kind of a global. <laughs> so you can answer it depending upon how you're explaining the answer. But the question that's going to be on the final is going to be very straightforward. But hopefully you see, if I just take this part out here and just say A is equal to this, it's going to take whatever A is in the entire program and assign it to this value. If I go variable A, I'm making a brand new A not reusing any A that might exist. So you'll get problems like this, well, not problems like this, you'll get the scenario that will happen on you and then you'll have problems where you print out A and you go, what is A? We changed A. But wait a minute, I was in this program here, how did it get changed? So it could cause you problems. So anyway, A dot length, uh, this is a regular for loop, looks like C++. B is equal to A dot reserve, you see I didn't actually go variable B here. I just said B, whatever B happens to be. So if I use B again, it's going to use whatever A dot reverse. Or it's going to be equal to A dot reverse and then until I change the value. So the VAR has to deal with scope. Just remember, it has to deal with the visibility of the variable. So there's many other predefined object types, string, math, date, regular expression, number. Numbers have uh, limits. There are conversions to string. Uh, regular expressions or regular expressions like in, in Linux and Unix environment. So date conversions, <coughs> math, um, comes in handy for different calculations. We also have predefined objects as we've seen so far. Document, navigator, screen, and window. This is kind of a repeat again. I still haven't made it to decision making, which is where I stopped last time, but I'm just kind of reviewing for you. Because it has been a whole week. Um, the document object. So we have many attributes in the current document that, that are available as well. We can get at the title of the document, the URL. One of your assignments is actually having you get at the URL, I believe, or the last modified date or something, which is not on the list, but it's one of the properties that is associated with it. 
all forms, colors, links, and images. And so here we have a document dot write and are using this plus for concatenation. So when in doubt, it treats everything like JavaScript treats everything like a string. So if you use plus in here and you have a string, it's going to say, oh, this is concatenation. So it's going to take this and use it as concatenation. If you put a number in here and you go one plus one, and it can actually treat it both like numbers, then it'll give you two and not eleven. So it'll kind of, it, it's pretty smart actually, a little bit. But you can do a direct conversion for, you know, definite reliability because what if you had like space one plus one space, those little spaces <coughs> that maybe didn't get truncated or that, you know, kind of ended up in the input when the user put it in there or something, that could cause it to be read as a string instead of a number. So strings where you have spaces after are usually good. Strings where you have the spaces before the number usually cause problems. So we can always, <clears throat> you know, guarantee your results by doing a convert. So convert it to a float or something. Or to an integer and then you're guaranteed not to be treating it like a string. Okay, so here's the, uh, the JavaScript example. We've seen this already as well. And uh, here's the, the script in the comments. Remembering how to put comments in is also something we covered last time. And then here's a function. <coughs> so the keyword function is used uh, to define the function. And this function is called add. And add returns x plus y, which is taken in on the command line. These are um, parameters that are passed to the function. And then we have events. And the events are supported by event handlers in the system. So the browser uh, might execute JavaScript commands with it when a particular event occurs. As an example, when the navigation goes off the page to another page, and that's what I was talking about last time, where you put those little redirects in there, or you put, you know, on an unload, load, so the page never unloads, which is kind of irritating to some people, but people do this all the time just to, most of them just to see if it works, but it does work. <laughs> so it makes web browsing a little irritating. In fact, it looks almost hokey if people can't exit off of your page. It kind of gives a bad impression, so... Also, sometimes the results of the command are, can be determined for different actions. If something fails, uh, if something fails to load, if something needs to be redirected. So, here is a simple event handler program that looks at the window size, and then if you try to resize the window, it reopens it back up with a bigger size. So it plays around with the window size. And uh, this is one with buttons, as we've seen before. We can alert here on click, where we have an alert that comes up on a click of a button on a form. Uh, that makes it easy to um, program events into the system. And here's some other ones that we looked at already. The on unload, the on load, the on click, <coughs> on uh, mouse up, on mouse down, on double click, you know, the link events and things. We can change colors, we can add highlights, we can do all sorts of different things to it to change the look and the appearance of the particular GUI component So, uh, using the events. So, And here's a formal definition of what I've been talking about so far, the document object model. So it's the naming hierarchy, if you wanted a definition, what is this thing? It's the naming hierarchy used to access the individual components of the HTML document. <coughs> so. The Netscape, or the Firefox, or the Chrome, or the Internet Explorer, all of them have different document object models. So it's a little different. All of them are a little bit different, which is why nobody likes to use it anymore. You can, you can use it for common things, but if you rely on it for a lot of your functionality, you're going to run into incompatibility issues. But on the load, you can always test to see what browser is being used. Depending upon what browser is being used, then you change the code to match the browser so that you can get a eh, you know more predictable functionality that's coming out of that. So easy to use if uh, the name is all entities, as an example, a form, a field, images and things. <coughs> so here's an example of using the document object model where we have uh, input coming in and this is just using a document calling this getting a document dot my form dot age dot value from a form that is called my form that's on the document with an age and the age is the input field here and we have a value that's going to be entered in that's going to be um, entered in by the user that's going to be captured as the value. You'll use this with PHP, with Python, with JavaScript. All scripting languages use this 
So it's not really part of the scripting language, it's the document object model. So it's how you're getting a value from a form to take the value, do a calculation on it, I don't know, send it somewhere else, um, process another piece of information with it. So, And most people think it's part of the scripting language, but it's not as the document object model that you're using. And this is still being used. So going back to what I said about the different browsers, this is fairly compatible between all browsers. Pretty safe to assume that you're going to follow through, especially if you've identified something on the form, you've created the form, and you've given the form a name, guaranteed to exist. What may not exist is the document or the window built-in functions or built-in attributes. They might be a little bit different. So, like the title will probably be okay, but you know, last modified date might be different or something. So, form field validation um, done quite often with JavaScript because you don't want to waste server resources for this. So, you put the form field validation on the client side and you have a little bit of JavaScript that's in the form that corrects the form information. You know, it puts those little red um, asterisks or highlights something to say that this is, you know, this is not right. You need to put a number in or a string in or something. And uh, corrects it so that the information that actually gets sent to the server is the correct information that the server is looking for. So, so in this event button is pressed, everything is checked, so you can prevent the request from happening what you're going to do it on the on-submit. So. And here's a checking field. Um, a couple of uh, semesters ago I had you write form validators and checkers. The only problem is there's so many of them out there on the internet. <laughs> so you can probably download half a dozen of them quite easily and they're all the same. So form validation, I, don't, I wouldn't even do it yourself. I'd get like an open source utility for it. And there's a ton of .js JavaScript files. I mean you know how to use those. You just copy the file into the directory load it in the header section and then use the functionality. So nobody really writes their own form validation. They'll use something that's been written that's readily available for the most part. And actually that's another thing you can do if you don't decide you don't want to write your own JavaScript functions um, is there's plenty of things that are out there that are open source. I mean don't go out and steal somebody's JavaScript function but um, usually people will give it away or allow others to use it with permission. So then you can download it and not have to reinvent the wheel. And you can add the functionality to your website without having to uh, write the code yourself. So it's so an important note. In fact, that what we're looking at here is just a, how to do it. Here's a return. And on the return, we're going to run the check form method. And the check form method is going to go through and check the form. So this is kind of primitive, not very sophisticated. It's just checking the age. You can write your own methods, put it in there. But if you're going to do this a lot, you're going to have the same forms that have the same information on them. It's probably easier to put them in an external file and then just load the file. So, so important notes about form validation. It's a good idea to make sure the user fills out the form before submitting it. So the user might bypass the form. They can create a request manually or on their own forms or, you know, you don't want them essentially to to do things on their own because then you can't predict what's going to be inserted into the database. So on the client side, just as a general rule, you have more control about what the client's actually doing. Once it hits the server, it's either going to fail or pass through the server functionality. And now you're not going to get as much error checking, you're not going to get as much control on the overall process. So this is where we stopped actually, this is the new stuff. So it was a little bit of review of what we did last time. <laughs> so decision making and decision making code is what we're going to talk about today, which is sort of the rest of this lecture. And then there's another one right after it, uh, number 10. This is number 9. Number 10 gets into flow control and control statements. So what we're going to look at now is Boolean variables because flow control is done with a Boolean value, a true or false. So if something evaluates to true, then you're going to proceed. If it's false, then you're not going to proceed. How to compare values and uh, how to use the if structure and the if else structure, which is used a lot, actually. Um, you're going to see the if else used as a primary means for most of the flow control in JavaScript. So Boolean variables. It's a variable that holds a value that's either going to be true or false. So you can have a variable um, that where you're going to assign the value that's returned from an expression. Then check the variable. Say, if true, then continue. If not, and your form controls, actually, your form validators are going to do this as well. So 
you can actually look at the form validation code and you'll see it's doing an if something else, you know, okay. Send a, you know, highlight this in red and take that and, you know, put this pop-up window on the screen and tell the user he's a dummy or something. So. so, Boolean variables are used to answer simple questions that can pose in a program. For example, if the answer is true, we do something. If it's false, we do something else. So here's the creating of Boolean variables. So we go variable x. Remember, we don't have any data types in JavaScript. So we have variable x, and then x is equal to false. So there's our Boolean. <laughs> so now it's true or false. So it's not a string. It's actually a Boolean. Automatically assigned and automatic means it's a Boolean. So this means that x will be storing the value of false. Note that it is not a string and it's not a number. So, so we can compare values. And so we can compute two values together. We can determine whether they're the relationship, what their relationship is. Are they equal? Is one less than the other? Are they both not equal? So once we determine the relationship, we can store the information using a Boolean. So assign three variables, x, y, and z. So here's, this is common. z is equal to x is less than y. So whichever is inside of this expression always evaluates to a Boolean. In fact, this is true for all other programming languages as well, or most 90% of all programming languages. But in other languages, you have to say z is a Boolean value or, you know, if Boolean is a data type that's supported in the language. Um, but here, this is going to return, if x is smaller than y, it's going to return true. If not, it's going to return false. And then true or false is going to be assigned to z, which is kind of interesting, uh, which is how you're going to essentially do your evaluation. So if x is smaller than y, that's going to return true. If it's larger, it's going to return false. And so here's our comparing values. We can compare it in different ways. We have the less than, the less than, or equal to. It doesn't really matter what order you put these in. You can go equal to or less than if you wanted to. More common to see the, the equal, excuse me, equal second. So the equal is always like the second priority. The first one is, is it less than or greater than? So you can say less than or equal to. You're going to go less than first. And then you're going to go equal to second. No standard, however. This one is going to be equal, equal, because we know that the plain equals is the assignment expression, so we know that's going to be an assignment expression. We can easily change that, put the two equals in here, and then this will come out true or false, and assign that one to another variable if we wanted to. Does z equal this one here? So if it's true, true, it comes back true. If it's true, false, it'll come back false, because it's not equal. So, And then the not equals can also be done with the exclamation point equals to say not equals to. So here's some examples. If x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 3, then z is going to be, and you can go through, the, I'm not going to go through every one of these, but you can see there's actually no spaces in here. You can put spaces in here if you want to. There's no requirement that you have to put everything back to back. So spaces work. And here's some examples uh, to kind of think about. This one says is x not equal to y. So comes back true, I guess, because x and y are two different values. So. so here's our comparison with our strings. So you can use the equals operator, the two equals together, to compare two strings. So we can check if the two strings are similar. So we have name one is Bob, name number two is Fred. And so we have name one is equal to name two. No, not equal to. So you can tell if it's the same person. And then we have our logical operators. So now we're able to work with Boolean variables, so we're able to deal with multiple Booleans together. That's where we get the if true, <coughs> if false, and then we go through and we just nest in the logical operators until we get the results that we're looking for. So you might need to make multiple comparisons and then decide based on the results on what to do. So it requires using multiple or using logical operators, single or multiple together. I keep saying multiple because this is what I mean by it. The operator is in multiple. <laughs> so the and is two ampersands. The or, the not, means it's not equal. So the operation that's performed here would be an and. If you put one single and in there, you're going to get, well, that's an escape character for something else. You're going to get an ASCII code that comes out of that, actually. It's going to print to the screen. It's going to say, not a number, <laughs> or something. Uh, but to use together, then we have the double operators. So I don't know why, but I used to, I started out calling them back when I was learning this several hundred years ago. No, not that long. Actually, thousands of years ago from the, my costume today. 
when I learned this many, many, two or three hundred years ago. <laughs> For people on the video who can't see me, I'm wearing a vampire outfit. <laughs> so, back when I was your age. <laughs> no, I, I called them double operators because they're, they're really gall called operators, but I catch myself occasionally and go, double operators, because that's how I remembered it. Otherwise, if you don't put double in, if you don't put two in, make it double, it doesn't work. So. Which is kind of the same in some other languages, actually. Iteration is done through double operators, like Pascal um, uh, was one of those languages. That was no longer, Pascal was around when I was, you know, your age. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so. All right, so these operators can be used uh, on any one of the two Boolean values, and it will result in a Boolean value itself. So here's more of the double double, double operators here. The expression true and and true is true, true, false, false. They have to be a complete match. So a false, a false is a false. A false and a true is a false. A true and a false is a false. But a true and a true is a true. So this is where the and works into place. Or the or, true or true is true, true or false. So you're going to get more trues out of this because one or the other. It doesn't really matter which one. So putting it all together, logical table requires two Booleans. So this is the comparison we can make results. In a Boolean, we can use these to compare logical operators where needed. So we have the logical operators and the Booleans that will come in handy when we have to make decisions. And when do we make decisions? Well, when we use if statements for making decisions. So one key decision statement is if. So they call them, in JavaScript, they call them decision statements. In other languages, they call them flow control. Because in other languages, we're controlling the flow of the program by the user input and how the program is supposed to execute. In JavaScript, is you know, should we print this to the screen or not? Should we do this or not? So we're making decisions for the user. So the if statement allows us to determine the value of the Boolean and then based upon that particular value, either execute it or skip the code, go to something else. So it's the easiest way to control the code we're going to run. So here's how the if works. If, and this is what I was talking about before, a Boolean expression, you could put anything in there. Actually, you could put the word true in there. Or you could put x in there if x is a Boolean and it equals true or false. So actually, you could put x in there if it's not a Boolean. And, uh, and you could say if x is smaller than 1 or something, you know, and then test it. Then we have statements, and then we have the opening and closing brackets, just like a function, actually, to give us the scope of the statements. So here's a variable, a variable number. Number is equal to prompt. Enter a number in. If number is less than 10, write this to the screen. If number is greater than 10, write that to the screen. So we're using multiple ifs with opening and closing brackets in this particular example. Mm, then we have if the number is less than 10, and this is the explanation for the previous example that I just went through. I'm going to assume that you guys have seen this in other programming languages at one point in your computer science career, <laughs> so or non-computer science career or whatever. If not, you can download slice that and go through it slower. Here's the if-else statement. So the if-else structure where we have an else that follows an if. Uh, where this is where things get kind of complicated. In fact, this is why a lot of programmers don't like the if else. Because if you put too much if, 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 you know, because you can nest these things, you know, like five in, and then you have else, 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 <laughs> five echoing going out. It's hard to tell which else is going to which if and which, and when, when does it all end, you know, and how the flow is going. And uh, usually that's where you're spending most of your time troubleshooting the problem of the decision making. And here it is here. So usually, uh, by default, what JavaScript does is it takes the else and it corresponds to the previous if in the sequence. So you can go else, else, if, 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 if five times, and else, 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 else five times, actually, believe it or not, without even indenting or doing anything, just, you know, just list them out. And you just know this is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Oh, this is number one, number two. It's actually easier to keep track of it that way. Some people number them. They go if one, if two, if three, if four. <laughs> You know, just put a little comment in there. And then you know the else for number five matches the else for number five. Excuse me, the if for number five. And you can get the order right. That's if you write the structure first. But who writes the structure first? Instead, you'll put one and then you'll oh, put an if in here. See, then you put an if inside of the existing if. And then you put the inside of the elf, you put another if in there. And then all of a sudden, you start getting confused. So comments can really help you, long story short. 
So here's the if-else example again with uh, else in here. Before we just did if. So if the if passes or if the if fails, something's going to happen. So And it's usually by default true. So if the number is smaller than 10, you're just looking for true, so if true. If you went if not, and you can actually put a not in here, explanation point. If it's not, which means if it's false, <laughs> then you're checking to see if it's going to be, uh, if, if you want to write it. And then the else is going to correspond to the if, which is different than doing, going if, if, because then one of them is going to go, or the other one is going to go in this case. So this one's going to go automatically if this one doesn't go. You could fail all the ifs and none of the else's. Well, if you don't have any else's, none of them is going to work. But you could fail all the ifs and nothing could be printed to the screen in the other scenario. So more on the if. And the if and the if-else statements are building blocks for decision making. So we are used to flow control, flow control or control of the code that's being executed and which one is going to be skipped. So it allows the user to input information that will affect how the program will act. So some possible problems. One key problem with dealing with variables is making sure that you're comparing what you want to compare, apples and apples, which is how numbers and strings end up becoming a problem from the perspective of the user entering an input. You should be careful that the user enters in the correct information and is actually giving you something that's going to compare correctly. So you can basically use this to validate the user input. It said, enter your GPA and you put in your name. It can come back and say, you know, if you're using an if else statement to check the input, it can come back and say, hey, not your name, your GPA or something. And then you can be more intelligent about the input, um, the error checking on the input. So if you're trying to compare numbers and the user enters letters, it could cause problems as well. So here's an example. So if we try to compare a number entered in by the user, but the user enters in a string. I mean, can the comparison will still happen? It will still happen, uh, but it'll come back false. So you might try to use a number entered in by the user later, but because it's a string, it will cause an error message as well. So the results may not turn out to be what you want them to be. So checking the input. This is where we get the is not a number and not a number. So we can actually check. There's a method that says is NAN. Is it not a number? <laughs> So we don't see not a number on the screen, essentially. So we can check the input as the user puts it in with a function is not a number, which is automatically built into the to the system. So the fun you don't have to write it yourself. So if the function allows us to determine the parameter is NAN, so you you can possibly avoid the not a number showing up all over your form when the user types stuff in. So. So now you can determine if a value is a number, and we'll be able to ask the user to re-enter the information if you think it's not correct. So here's the test here. So variable number, comma, test. Number is equal to prompt, enter a number. Test is going to be equal to, and then here's the function, is not a number, number? <laughs> Which means, is it not a number? So if true, then the input was a string. If not, if false, if it comes back false, the else is going to work and says, oh, the input was a number. If it's not a number, and it's a string, <laughs> so which seems kind of backwards, but uh, you should say, is it a string? You said, is it not a string? Is it not a number? Then it is a string. So, but it comes from the not a number kind of error message that you get. So, well, what about bad input? So we receive bad input from the user. We can warn them that the input is incorrect with an alert box. Not really anymore, actually. We can still do an alert box, but we don't normally see alert box anymore. Instead, now we see the label in red, or we see an asterisk or something next to the label that appears. That's now visible, that was invisible before. We just changed the status of that um, so that we can determine um, what we're looking at in terms of what the user needs to correct. More so than an alert box, because browsers have a tendency to uh, block alerts and pop-ups these days. So that's one way to give the user some information. So here's an example of an alert. If you want to use an alert, this is an alert on the screen. So this is actually you can put this anywhere you want. Great for error checking, actually, these days. For, for error checking and bug checking your programs. So uh, let's see, don't say this one. We have another uh, lecture today. It's only 20 slides long. So don't worry. Not gonna be too bad. But it, don't worry, we've still got time for food. Food doesn't start till 12.30. <laughs> I 
think it was only 10 something, or almost 11, I think, maybe. So we're still good. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to be the first one in the food line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, control structures. This is a continuation with a few more examples of what we looked at before in determining uh, decisions. So this is the same as decision making, but this one's going to be labeled control structures because it's going to be used for more flow control rather than decision making in terms of the examples. So this might look familiar if you haven't worked on the GPA program yet or if you have worked on it. Uh, some of the information in here might help you with some calculations. So you add the grade to the total. The total might be equal to total plus grade. Add one to the counter. Counter is going to be equal to counter plus one. These are common kind of examples of doing some statements that are going to change variables. So here's a flowchart of JavaScript sequence of structures that are going on. Here's a sequence of control that's going on. We can look at an if else selection selection uh, statement structure as well. So here's a flowchart of a single selection in a structure. So it comes in and says, well, is the grade larger than or equal to 60? If true, then print passed. If not, you know, if false, well, false is going to go back in and ask you again. So in the old days, people used to write flowcharts, actually, when they were designing source code, because it had to, it helped you actually design the if and the else's and all of the flow control. And then we got more elaborate structures and uh, control structures. And the elaborate control structures were like the case in the switch and some of the other loops and things. And then uh, it got a little bit more difficult to um, program those things with a flowchart. So flowcharting actually is not really as popular as it used to be because things are more complicated. But here's a flowchart of a double selection with an if-else. So we have a false, goes back in error, and prints failed. True, prints false, and it comes back into another selection operator. So, so here's a counter-controlled repetition. So instead of using an if-then, or if else, which is going to give us directional from one point A to point B to point C in terms of a flow. The counter control says for so long do something. So here we have a while repetition. I used a for example, but the why is very similar to this. But the while, I shouldn't say why, while is going to go while something is true, which is interesting. So product is less than or equal to 1000 while that is true then do something. And if it's true, product is equal to two times the product. So keep doubling the product. Eventually it's going to be larger than 1000. And then the while is not going to hold up anymore and the, it, we're going to go false in the false direction. So I counter controlled it needs to be stopped somehow within the loop itself otherwise the loop will run forever and not stop. And here's an example. In fact you can cut paste and put this in. This is doing an average. In fact, if you're still stuck on that assignment that's asking you to put in GPAs and to calculate some stuff, here's a while loop for processing the GPAs and coming up with an average GPA. So the while loop will execute the statements of the body until the value of the grade counter equals 10. So while grade counter is smaller than or equal to 10, so it's going to loop 10 times. So if you had said uh, user enter in five grades, and they put in 5, then change that value to 5. And then prompt the user to input a grade. And this is asking you for the input. So this is one way that you can actually design that grade input program. Um, whether you're doing the graphical version of it or whether you're using the, um, the other version of it that's just putting it all together for you. And you're just printing it to the screen. And so you can convert the input uh, to an integer here by doing a parse int. And then you're parse inting on the grade and you're adding the new grade to the total. So the total is equal to total plus grade value. And grade value is equal to parse integer grade. And the grade is equal to the window.prompt enter a grade. So you can you know, basically take in your input this way. You don't actually have to split it if you don't want to. The assignment instructions actually have you perform a split, I believe, or recommend that. But you don't actually have to do it that way. You can do it this way. You can't get the split to work. So. And we're also going to want to increment the counter because sometime, somewhere in this loop, we're going to want to end the loop eventually. And then we can calculate the average of the grades that the input uh, the user has inputted by going at total divided by 10, the average. And then write the results to the screen here by doing a document.write. And this is an interesting variation. It's line write dot, excuse me, W-R-I-T-E-L-N, no dot, uh, which is going to put a line return at the end. So write and then put a line return at the end of the line. 
which is what that's going to do. So here's the dialog. It displays 10 times, and the user inputs in 188, 93, etc., and so forth, and it takes and computes the average for you. So there's no reason why everyone shouldn't get 100% on that assignment <laughs> at this point. Uh, so you prompt the user to enter in a grade minus 1 to end. So you can have it controlled by, well, if the value is equal to minus 1, then end the while loop in this particular case. So. And then uh, window.prompt, this is each iteration of a loop will open a prompt dialog allowing the user to input another grade in. So, so the prompt's going to get the grades in. So it's a nice little program. You can actually cut and paste it. It comes out of a deedle and deedle text that's uh, the credits for it. It's at the end of the lecture. But uh, it's not a bad um, example to, to kind of figure out how you're going to actually put the input in. So, And here's the program output. So we have the average that's computed from that. So, And there's just another way. In fact, this is three different ways of doing the same program, getting the same results. So using a while loop to go 10 times, using a while loop to wait for negative 1 to be inputted in, and then this particular case is going to do a prompt on a while. And then um, value 2 means that the student failed. Value 1 means that the dialog means that the student passed an exam. So it's going to do a pass-fail on different values. And then it's going to look for failures, is incremented and passes. So this is doing multiple increments inside of the same loop using a counter again. So it goes through 10 times, and it's going to keep track of what you passed and what you failed, essentially. And then here, if more than eight students pass the exam, the student's going to say, raise the tuition. <laughs> no. It's humor, people. <laughs> All right, so is it, does it say yes? Is raised tuition? Hmm. All right, so here's the program output that occurs: examination results with examination results for passes and fails. So. And here's incrementing and decrementing operators. So here we have for those people who are not who don't have a programming background, we have the assignment operator. So actually, even if you do or you're studying programming, this might help you to add something and then make it equals to is a plus equals plus plus, minus minus. So some people see I plus plus, I minus minus. It's decrementing or incrementing. Uh, shorthand. So here's the example expression where it's going to be C plus equals 7. It takes, that's like C is equal to C plus 7. So it's a shorthand that leaves you from having to go like down here the C plus plus, the A plus plus, or you can say A is equal to A plus A. <laughs> So you're just substituting in the A's and you're leaving all the repeated A's out of there. It takes a little bit shorter in terms of the expression. So F is equal to 6, divide by F divided by 3. So. so it basically does an assignment plus an increment or a decrement, depending upon what you're trying to do. And here's an example of it being used. So we can post increment. Which is kind of interesting. The plus plus C adds it before evaluating C. The C plus plus increments after the evaluation of C. Both of them might actually make a significant difference uh, depending upon the results of what it is you're trying to do. Whether you want the increment or decrement to occur before you take a look at the value of C or if you want it done after. So in a for loop, you go I is equal to 1, I is less than 10, I plus plus means look at I first, which is going to be equal to 1 then plus plus, so now i is 2, then i is 3, <laughs> then i is 4. What are you guys looking at? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Anyway, so I'm trying to be serious here. Uh, program output, post, and well, I'm the one who's making the distraction. Uh, Pre-incrementing and post-incrementing. So we have 5, 5, 6, or 5, 6, 6. So the point I'm trying to make here is that the value which is being printed to the screen is going to either be incremented after or before it's printed to the screen. Depending upon which method you take, you're going to get a slightly different value. So sometimes when you're off by one, it's usually the order in which you're incrementing or decrementing a counter that's going to basically be affecting your results. So it was six, but you wanted it to be five. So then you have to tweak the order in which you're doing the increment or the decrement to get the program to look right. So split, this is the one that most people figured out for that assignment if you've done it already. Split method is a handy way to split a string into two or more parts based on the character that divides the parts or the delimiter in this particular case. 
So a character that divides the part can be anything. It can be many things, a comma, a, splat, a slash, a symbol, maybe this one here, or anything of your choice, which is great because you're not limited to one or two things. And so here's a split example. If you cut and paste it and put it into a file, call it split.html. You can run it and it will work. And what is this going to do? It's going to divide a string out. So it's going to take um, this home forward slash my tools forward slash my tools.cgi and split it out with the backslashes. So here we have where is my tools dot split. And we're putting in the parentheses here, the delimiter character. And I'm going to put up an alert box. And then now we have an array that's automatically created from the split function. It's going to give us array item 0, which is going to be the first one home. Number 1 is going to be my tools, number 2, et cetera, and so forth, automatically for us. So there's no loop in this. So I have seen people try to do the split with a loop. You know, 4, x is equal to 1, x is less than 10, you know. Split it. What ends up happening is you get 10 splits instead of just one. <laughs> So it does it for you automatically. People that would do that are familiar with programming and they go, how does that work? You have to put it into a loop. The thing with uh, JavaScript is a more automated. So there's not less, with arrays, it's a little bit easier to work with them because you don't have to loop through the for loops and stuff. All right, so here's the divide, uh, on click, run the divide string and the value is gonna be equal to go. So this is the value of this so we can, make go go at other times by looking at the document object model if we wanted to. But uh, And here we can, you know, because the value of it's going to be, uh, which is going to appear on the screen, we can run, click on go, and it's going to basically run this script for us. So, so as promised, we're going to get out early, don't worry. So <laughs> that was the second part. And uh, if you're brand new to this, I would highly recommend actually going in and cutting and pasting and putting it into text files. I've done this before, but I think we've done it a lot in this class so far. So, but um, and run it, and you can actually kind of see uh, what's going to happen with it. So, the other activity for today is to go over the midterm exam that's been posted. Midterm exam, believe it or not, it's not due till the end of the course. The end of the course is coming up soon. However, let's take a look at the schedule. End of the course. So, for people who are watching this video and looking at JavaScript, no more JavaScript. We're done. Now we're doing the rudimentary course management stuff, uh, which involves looking at a midterm. Uh, so what do we get going on here? I was looking for the dates, actually. Uh, so our semester dates aren't on here. Um, I want to say the first weekend in December. Actually, the LMS would have it. Hold on one second. Let me take a look at the LMS. The LMS has the due dates. So if I go in here, and I can look at the teacher's version for this particular class. Uh, to be updated. Great. Assignments. The due dates on everything is December 14th, is how I've set this, which is actually pretty good. It's way late, like, you know, almost close to Christmas. And today is only November, no, this is October 31st. <laughs> Hello. No, I keep thinking it's November 1st, because that's tomorrow. <laughs> so... We have uh, two months left, or a month and a half. A whole month in November and a couple weeks in December. So you don't want to wait till the very end. I put the midterm in here, and the midterm exam is also available on the bhacker.com website. And it is going to be take home midterm exam right here. What do you have to do for the midterm? The midterm is actually kind of easy. Uh, so let's take a look at it. Are you hitting her? Uh, so let me view in on this a little bit. Let's see, zoom. 200%. Okay. So here are the instructions for the midterm exam. So now you've got a lot of details here because I'm not interested in testing your ability to memorize. Instead, I'm testing your ability to use HTML and CSS and to apply concepts such as nesting, elements, attributes, properties, values, and writing them with the proper syntax. So what you've got is a bunch of instructions. 
and you're going to assemble these into a page. And you're going to take and upload the page for me. Really easy. Or you can put it in a zip file if you want. But you're writing an HTML document using HTML and CSS. You're going to include the document type. I'm not going to give you instructions for how to do it. That's the thing. You have to go through the lecture material. You have to go through the internet. If you're going to do it this way and cut and paste it, you can do it this way. Only thing is you might find a more current document. You can use any document type that you want. Just kind of one of the reasons why I'm going through this is to give you your options. Um, you can cut and paste and use what's here, or you can use a better document type or a more current document type <laughs> statement. This is dated. This is, this is from 4.0. You can use 5.0 if you want. You can use anything you want. <clears throat> but you're going to include a document type. You're also going to make sure that you include the elements for the head, the body, the title, style, tags. And you also need to figure out uh, the proper order of the nesting of these elements. So the HTML to the head, to the, well, I'm not going to give all I'm giving it to the body, you know, <laughs> the hierarchy, uh, which is kind of easy. And then one of the elements is going to require an attribute type with the value type CSS to include your uh, CSS file. And you're going to put it in the text inside of the body element with the appropriate tags. And uh, you'll need the P tag as well as the H1 and H2 and H3 tags. And you're going to use a CSS property text align. So what you're going to do is read through all these things here and assemble it to the best of your knowledge. So it's can you understand what I'm asking for and then can you put it together? So I know everybody's document should look fairly similar. <laughs> Please do it yourself. I will consider this, however, when we do the plagiarism check. Otherwise, everybody in the class is going to fail this thing because all of your documents are going to look the same, hopefully. So it's a garbage in, garbage out. If you don't do it yourself, you're not going to learn anything. Do it yourself. It might be a good exercise, actually, to make sure, kind of a cross check to make sure that uh, you actually understand all the different concepts of the course. And then uh, it's better pre preparation as well for the final as well. but. You're going to use the EM tag to mark up the text wild, to emphasize something. You're going to use the anchor tag, and you're going to put a link into a web address for a uh, wiki for caffeine. Um, you can use a font family, the scanf, sans serif. You're going to use a CSS to make uh, the second level headlines red. You're going to use an ID tag. To, uh, for the appropriate HTML element along with the CSS to make the words green tea, the color green. And remember in the style sheet, you're going to put the, the pound sign in front of the name of the ad, of the ID before the specifying the property. And that property you need is color for that. So it's actually kind of easy, I think. It's very straightforward, kind of easy. Probably take a couple hours, maybe an hour to do. But I do understand that most of yours will look identical. If you actually follow this correctly, it should all look identical. So please be honest and do it yourself. Uh, December 14th. I know it's a midterm, but I put the due date for everything on December 14th. Because you know you do have five assignments to do. And hopefully you guys are working on those assignments. I've gone through all of them, I believe, even the last one. A couple weeks ago, actually. So we're going to end the in the uh, the class on the early side today because you I'm sorry uh, it depends I can't remember right now but it depends on what it's asking for I believe it's going to ask for an external one I know this because if I take a look at the instructions it says I'm going to use a text CSS here uh, but is it going to tell me whether or not I have to do it externally one of the elements required are the type. No, actually, I can do that internally or I can do that externally. If it doesn't tell you, do anything you want. If it tells you what to do, do it that way. I don't believe it tells you whether you have to do it externally. Um, so you can do it externally if you'd like, or you can put it all in the same document. Your choice. That's a very good question. Were there any other questions on the midterm? Are there any questions on any of the assignments for the course? Hopefully you guys are working on this stuff, which is why I'm mentioning it. <laughs> Plus the midterm has just been made available. If you're in the computer graphics class, I'll probably send a message out about the computer graphics midterm. If not, you'll hear about it next week. But there's no computer graphics class today. 
Um, anything else? So let me stop this video then.